Pentagon One. Uh-huh. Hi, everybody. Ken Croak here. I'm with Barry Trailer from CSO Insights, an old friend of mine. We've been uh, planning this webinar together for a while, and we're excited to do this today. It's, a, it's great timing because we're going to talk about the trends of last year with the landmark report that, that Barry and his team have come out uh, with every year. Welcome, Barry. Good to have you here. Well, Ken, it's always good to be with you. So I'm glad to be here, and thanks, everybody, for taking time out to join us today. Absolutely. You bet. I wanted to tell a little bit. I know Barry and I, we were down at Dreamforce this past fall and, and realized we haven't done a webinar together. And, and, and In fact, I think we did a couple of our, our summits together, but we've been mm-hmm. wanting to do this. Barry and I have a tradition with Dave Elkington, uh, our CEO. Whenever we're at the same show, we we always call ahead and we have a, a, a breakfast meeting together. And I think we've done that probably three or four times over the years. And it's been fun to catch up. We're also busy lately, but but uh, we're going to keep trying to do this. And I think this would be a fun tradition, Barry, at the first of each year to sort of report back on last year and forecast the, the, the next. And I think we're going to have a lot of fun today. But I'm going to go ahead and turn him loose. He's got some amazing little insights and sneak peeks into this survey that's about ready to come out. And uh, Barry, go ahead. Thanks so much. Yeah, well, again, thanks for having me in, and uh, thanks for joining us. And yeah, what I thought we would do today is um, we've, we've had over a thousand companies respond to uh, our 2015 sales performance optimization. We call it the SPO survey, and uh, the report will be out February 3rd. But uh, you know, as Ken mentioned, we were talking and thought this would be a kind of a fun sneak preview of some of the things we've uh, we've seen and see if we can add some value for all of you here. Uh, if you're not familiar with CSO Insights, we have four surveys that we do each year. The uh, SPO launches the beginning of Q4 each year. So October 1st, we launch that, gather data through Q4, and then uh, crunch the numbers through through January. And as I mentioned, we release the report the beginning of February. Uh, I, I will just say two things about that up front, and you'll be reminded later. Um, we are keeping the survey open uh, right up until February 3rd. You can take it. And with InsideSales.com for the next month, uh, particularly we're going to be releasing in addition to the four you see here, uh, an Inside Telesales Performance Optimization Study. So um, I know that's of special interest to this audience, and, and it's a little extra something we're doing. So uh, I'll just mention that right now. But in addition to the SPO, uh, when that releases in February, we launch our SMO, our Sales Management Optimization Survey, gather data for a couple of months. That releases mid-April. Uh, we then launch our uh, Lead Management and Social Engagement Survey. Uh, again, gathers data for a couple of months and releases right after the 4th of July. And then over the summer, we gather data for our Sales Compensation and Performance Management Study. And that releases uh, mid to late uh, September. People are getting ready to make a run for the roses and you know, get ready for the coming year. And then it's, the cycle starts all over again with the SPO on October 1. But again, and in addition to these four, there will be a uh, telesales survey this year. Hope you'll participate in that. Okay, so what's up? Nothing new here. Change is in the air. Everybody knows about a change you know, happening all over the place. And so we try and quantify that a little bit. And um, we've been trying this for a number of years, but the, the numbers are quite dramatic this year in terms of uh, if you look, the, the dark bars increasing noticeably, the, the pink uh, bars increasing significantly. Uh, none of these is less than 50%, and you can see uh, increase in competitive activity is uh, 70% of folks said it's either noticeable or significant increase. Customer expectations, no surprise here to anybody in the audience, uh, those are increasing like mad, almost as much as competitive activity you can see here. Uh, and in terms of noticeable, uh, a little bit more. Changes in the customer marketplace, breadth and complexity of your product line, and rate of product uh, introductions into new markets. All of these things are increasing like mad. And, and what's interesting about this, one of the places we, that this telegraphs to, and we've been tracking now for some time, some time being the last several years, is sales rep ramp up time. Ken, I don't know if you've seen this, but we've seen sales rep, new rep ramp up time until they're fully productive, nearly triple over the last uh, seven or eight years. And, and this here is one of the reasons, it's not just the change, but in terms of 
um, buying processes. People don't just want to hear about products. They want to hear about what you know about their business. And that used to come you know, two, three, four years into a sales rep's uh, you know, tenure with a company, not day one. And um, it, it really, all of this change combined with the changed buyer expectations uh, is really a uh, pretty dramatic impact. You know, uh, Barry, for like eight years running, the, the big issue in, in the inside sales space was leads. And then about two years ago, it became hiring. And then most recently, onboarding. And, and that sort of plays to what you're saying. It, 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 it's gotten so complex that now one of the advantages is helping the reps just get their head around it. Is that sort of what you're saying? Yeah, very much so. And, you know, you can't, the old days, I mean, I'll, I'll give you some idea how old this is. You know, you used to bring new hires in, you know, take a drink out of this fire hose for the next week, you know, product, product, product. And then the old line was you'd parachute them into their uh, territory with, you know, a copy of the yellow pages. That's how old that model is. <laughs> but really, the whole notion of, um, you know, bringing somebody in and basically cramming their, their heads full of stuff they get back to their office, their territory, whatever, and it, you know, on Monday morning, it's like, you know, now what do I do? And and then you just start, you know, they start looking for things to do and people to go do it with. Today, um, again, you know, the buyers are much more interested in what you can tell them about your about their business and how you can support them in their business. And that might be actually a good uh, segue to this next slide talking about change. You know, everybody I think is familiar with the life curve. You know, this purple curve you see on here, the star-studded red-letter day you came blasting in from the cosmos over on the left. You may not remember that day, but I'm sure you celebrate it each year. And then, you know, you sort of go through your slow growth infancy period, and then it ramps up during adolescence. And I'm speaking to a group in San Diego last week, they got a kick out of this. I have two daughters that are grown now, but this real steep, period, if any of you have teenage daughters, my name for that period of life is hormones on acid. <laughs> it's just that it's, it's a tough place to be. And then you get to the peak of this curve, which is generally, you know, 15 years past whatever age you are now, and then you come to the end, and depending on your belief system, that's it, or you start over, somebody picks up where you left off, you know, whatever. Um, here in California, uh, yeah, I'm a, a California native son, and, and we actually have the belief system that you can have several of these running at the same time, <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> parallel dimensions. <laughs> but anyway, enough of that. Uh, the real point of this is people go through this kind of change and growth since organizations are comprised of people. You know, they go through it as well. And so there's some distinctions being when you start off small as a company and you get big, you know, if you're successful and, like, no kidding. You know, you make a living with these kinds of insights. But there's more to it than that. You know, at, at, in the early stages, the deals themselves tend to be smaller. But as you get track record, you know, credibility, uh, make a name and so on, build a brand, the, the deals get larger. And this is where things start to get interesting because as the deal size gets larger and the risk of the deal or the perceived risk gets larger, then the decision point gets higher in the organization. As you get higher in the organization, you know, you have more people beneath the decision, the final decision, um, you know, to cover. And so over on the left, when you have smaller opportunities, smaller company, you have more individual or contributors or lone wolves, sometimes referred to. On the right, it's more team selling, you know, and um, you've got more bases to cover, more facts and ground to cover in terms of complexity and different people, you know, finance people want to look at it one way, users want to look at it another, you have subject matter experts you bring in, technical pre-sales, you know, all these folks, not news to anybody. But it's also a function or reflection of your growth and your success. When that happens, uh, on the left, when you're small, term organizational development jargon, you're called organic term you may or may not be familiar with in this context. As you grow, you become, turn everybody's familiar with, increasingly bureaucratic. 
Organic just means everybody's in the know, sort of through osmosis, because everybody's touching each other. You know, it's just a small organization. You want to know what's happening? You just lean over your shoulder and ask somebody, "Hey, what's the deal with that order? You know, did it go out or did it get booked? Has it been invoiced? Whatever." When you get bigger, much larger, become more bureaucratic. You have to start having things like, um, you know, standard procedures, policy manuals, but you also have things like sales process infrastructure, CRM systems, all of this stuff that supports the growth and the performance of a larger company. The other thing I want to point out is on the left, uh, when you start off, you tend to be product driven. It's all engineering and manufacturing driven. You know, in the old school days it's called build a better mousetrap. You talk about your product. As you succeed, as you get bigger and as a, again as a decision point and the buying decision moves up, People tend to be less and less interested and hands-on on the specifics. You know, there are other people in the organization who have vetted all of that. Now they want to know, how do you improve our business, our competitive position? How do you help us with our customers and so on? So you're more sales and marketing driven. Now, the, the thing that often happens when these new changes, the things on the right start coming in, you know, bureaucracy, process, infrastructure, and so on, people you know, said to resist change, they resist the being changed. And you know, hear people say, you know, I don't know, if we're so messed up, we got to change all this stuff. We seem to be doing fine before. I mean, you know, we did sell $150 million worth of stuff in the last year. It's like, it's not that you were doing things wrong. It's that you did things right and you succeeded. But if you look at this slide, you know, all together, you can see that if you continue to do the things on the right that you did on the left, it will serve you less and less well over time. And that's the whole point. It's really about embracing change and um, getting after it and, again, you know, team selling and group. So, you know, this, this slide is really showing that it's about teams. The thing we said uh, back in 2010 is collaboration is the word of the decade. You know, we're approaching the halfway mark, and we truly believe that. You know, it's, it's about coordinating your folks and, and really uh, you, you see this sort of increased need for people to play together. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll take a breath here. Ken, I don't know if you have anything you want to add to this or not. Yeah, I, I was just saying how amazing this has been in our own business. You know, as we've grown, we've outgrown even one building. We're in multiple buildings, multiple locations. The old days when all you had to do was walk down the hall and uh, pull someone into a meeting and you know meeting room and get on the whiteboard. Those are gone now. You have to email, schedule a meeting, find a conference room, coordinate schedules, and that 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 whole team selling model requires more logistics than I ever realized. It seems like after we hit the 150 employee mark, uh, everything changes, especially as you get multiple locations. Uh, you have to plan for that, and it's a different model. Well, it is a different model, and you know that the curve I had up a moment ago is actually a little bit of a misdirect because it shows sort of the smooth, constantly upward uh, arc. And it turns out, you know, they're really like step functions. You know, there are challenges with less than ten, and then you know up to fifty people, and then you've got you mentioned one hundred and fifty people or two hundred, and, and then you have multiple buildings, start having multiple geographies and time zones. You know, when people start having you know theaters, you know, EMEA, APAC, Latin America, and so on. I mean, it becomes much more complex. And that's where, again, infrastructure and process come into play. And, uh, you know, again, we've been tracking that for a number of years. And, and uh, what we um, uh, show is in our sales relationship process matrix. Brian, I'm going to ask you to jump this ahead because it doesn't seem like I've got control of the mouse anymore. If you can move us to the next slide, that'd be great. Maybe I'm talking to myself now. <laughs> I'm here still. Brian, are you there? Everything, <laughs> everything, everything's frozen on my end. So I don't know the recording is frozen. The recording's frozen at a minute forty seven and oh. nothing's moving here. Yeah, I just lost. So, you know, having all these folks means you 
got to start having some uh, coordination, and and uh, that's where process comes in. You know, identifying identifying roles and responsibilities and best practices and so on. And again, we've been tracking this for several years now. Uh, it goes back to our first uh, first time we were published by HBR back in 2006 is when we started tracking. And on the um, on the horizontal axis, we've defined four levels of sales process implementation. Random, basically everybody doing their own thing. Informal, we have a documented sales process reps are exposed to and expected to use, but we don't monitor that. Formal process, where it's just the opposite. We have all of that, and it's reinforced, and it's enforced, and dynamic, where it's all of that, plus the constantly when uh, CSO called, called running the trap lines, you know, constantly asking what's changed, looking at the numbers, looking at the metrics, analytics, you know, period over period, um, rep versus rep, product by product, and so on. So, uh, you know, intensely uh, inspecting the business. And on the vertical axis, um, we have five levels of relationship from approved vendor up through preferred supplier, consultant, contributor, and ultimately partner today a lot of times called trusted advisor. In any event, what we're showing here is uh, the three performance levels that we've identified over time. And you can see about a quarter of folks are at performance level one. Uh, the, the biggest piece, 41%, are at performance level two. And then just over a third, 35% are at performance level three. And we look at four metrics to define that. Uh, percentage of overall revenue plan attained, percentage of reps meeting beating quota, uh, outcome of forecast deals or forecast accuracy, and total rep turnover. And um, looking at this slide, I want to show you how that's been trending over the last seven years from 2007 through uh, 2013. Uh, when we first started tracking this, 17% of folks um, we're at performance level three, 34 percent were performance level one. And you can see that uh, in 2012, we had uh, 37 percent was sort of the high water mark for performance level three, 21 percent performance level one, which means if you're down here at performance level one, you're seeing your competitors' tail lights get real small real fast. And then last year, a uh, little retreat to 35% performance level three, and an increase here, 24% uh, back to performance level one. And um, I won't give you the sneak. I'll give you a teaser here. Uh, the numbers have changed dramatically uh, when we look at 2014. We've got those figures. And uh, if you take the survey um, between now and February 3rd, you'll get the report. You'll see the numbers. But I can tell you there was a dramatic change uh, from last year. So um, we think that there's uh, something going on here. And part of what we think that is is a certain level of complacency that has set in. And I know you're going to talk a little bit about that as well. But um, set in in terms of things have gotten better. And as a result of that, we think uh, folks have relaxed a little bit from you know, 2008, 2009. When we had the Great Recession, everybody got focused. Everybody was heads down. Everybody was measuring. Everybody was, you know, sort of on the ball. And we think people are back on their heels a little bit right now. But again, you can read all about that. So, well, and I um, look, I look, Larry, at uh, Barry, at your uh, 2008 shift. I mean, look at that year. There was a massive change when things mm -hmm. tightened up. And then it's like mm -hmm. every single year it sequentially got a little bit better. And in 2012, mm -hmm. it seemed to top out. That that that's mm -hmm. that's amazing how we're forgetting we're forgetting the pain we went through during that recession. And I think we're like you said we're rocking back on our heels and sort of enjoying things. You you told me a fun story about the Yukon plant. Do you mind sharing that one? That was fun. Yeah, well, it, yeah, it's actually the Escalade. So in terms of short memory, uh, it's not just you know, people have forgotten how hard it was, how difficult it was. Um, you know, during the Great Recession, 2008, 2009, and uh, the unemployment figures. I don't know if you heard this, but just a couple weeks ago, the unemployment figures came out. And they were the lowest since the tech bubble was inflating. That's how good things have gotten. And wow. we think people started to to relax. They've forgotten 
you know, the, the lessons learned just a few years ago. So the thing I saw on, um, on the news is the Escalade plant is running three shifts, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They cannot build Cadillac Escalade fast enough because gas is about two bucks a gallon. You know, you can you couldn't hardly give those things away when you know when gas was five bucks a gallon. I mean, I remember the first <laughs> you know hose in the, in the, it popped out at a hundred bucks. I'm like, are you kidding me? You know, it, it, I couldn't believe it. And um, you know, electric vehicles, Prius, you know, was like running roughshod over everybody. Now. Everybody's got electric cars in their lineup here in California. They're required to have, you know, manufacturers required to offer an electric vehicle or hybrid vehicle. And they're all sitting on the lots, and now people are buying Escalades as fast as they possibly go. I got news for you. It's going to get expensive again. Mary, because I've got a compressed natural gas car, and back, you know, it was $1.73, and now who cares? It's the same price as gas, and, and I'm, yeah. I'm parking that sucker. I'm going back to my gas car for a while because it's just there's just been some major changes in the economy to the positive but but the people are forgetting the disciplines of the process i that process matrix on the previous slide yep. changed our world i mean we i remember the first time we saw you present that Barry and it was impressive to think that you know the power of of standardizing and then formalizing and then improving your process makes all the difference in the world. And, and from what you tell me, this, this has been a metric that always ties to performance. Isn't that what it, you're finding? It always ties to performance. And if we had more time, uh, I could show you. But again, folks who take the survey, they'll get the report. They'll see what the performance figures are on those four metrics, you know, revenue, quota, forecast outcome, rep turnover. And it tracks absolutely with performance levels. And again, the change was dramatic. Um, I'm going to jump ahead here to, well, there's one slide here that you liked when I, I, we talked about a little bit earlier, so I'll go ahead and put this up, and I'm probably going to jump over a few here. But, um, you know, one of the other things we've been talking about here for the last few years is culture eats strategy for breakfast. When you talk about, you know, there's a Peter Drucker quote, when you talk about the SRP matrix, you know, most people find themselves down sort of level two-ish, you know, yeah, we've got a process. We're not really that rigorous about it. And, yeah, we'll probably preferred supplier, maybe consultant. So they're kind of hanging out there right on the cusp of performance level one or two. But they really feel they need to, you know, if they're going to succeed, need to move up solidly into performance level two and maybe on to performance level three. Here are the questions you need to be asking yourself. Are you going to be hiring the same kind of people? Are they going to be doing the same kinds of things? Are you going to be tooling them up in the same ways? And so, you know, the answer is no. And so how are you going to be doing that? And people immediately start thinking in terms of strategy, and we think they also need to be thinking in terms of their culture, you know, because that doesn't change nearly as rapidly. And that's really the cornerstone that you want to build all of this on. But anyway, with respect to strategy, you often hear this acronym, um, SWAT, which is strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And uh, I think it's overrated. Uh, my version of this is sell what's on the truck. And, uh, <laughs> I love that. And one of my favorite business maxims is there's unlimited demand for the currently unavailable. So, you know, a, a rep will be talking to somebody and what Mike Bosworth used to call listening with happy ears. You know, they're they're hearing all the things they want to hear, but, you know, they're not getting anywhere. And, and uh, the, the maxim is um, unlimited demand for the currently unavailable is, you know, the stuff you're saying sounds great. And if it just did this, I'd be all over. We, we, we couldn't buy enough of it. And so the reps hear that. And they come running back and, you know, they're working with product people and they're hammering the company saying, we've got to have this, we've got to have this. And uh, I always say, sell what's on the truck. <laughs> you know, other people's that. job to do that. So kind of fun. Uh, I'm going to jump ahead here a couple. Uh, I'll just show you very quickly because I want to uh, promote, you know, taking of the survey. I just posted this on YouTube today. Uh, this is a we're, – we're doing a blog and a video each week, you know, to kind of give people a few more highlights and um, 
uh, three of the reports in uh, the SPO this year. We started this format last year. It's find more, win more, keep and grow more. And uh, the video I put up last week was find more, and this week was win more. So uh, I'll just go ahead and show you that. And then jump to, uh, I think some people may be interested in the kinds of things that we have in the report. The top sales effectiveness initiatives for the coming year. Um, and I write about this quite a bit in the going forward section, which is the final section of the report. Uh, enhanced lead generation, you know, always the, the top, you know, vote getter. Once had a, a president say, having a VP of sales say, I've got enough leads is like Elizabeth Taylor saying, I've got enough diamonds. You know, you just, they, they never have enough. And you can see some of the other things about revising the sales process, more closely aligning sales and marketing, and then things start to fall off after that. Um, we talk about this in the going forward section. and. Uh, you know, I think there are probably some additional insights. Um, the last piece I'll say, and then I know you've got some things you want to talk about, but this goes back to that sort of being back on their heels or, you know, maybe becoming a little bit complacent. One of the things we track each year is what percentage of the sales force is using the methodology they've been trained on. The investment's already been made. The people have been pulled out of the field. The methodology's already been bought. You've already spent time practicing. And uh, you know we find that uh, you know the majority of folks are using it less than three quarters of the time. Uh, one of the stories I tell all the time, you know, back in my Miller Hyman days when I was doing strategic selling, I had a guy come up to me a year after the training I was in at their sales kickoff to talk about sales mastery. He came up, he goes, "Man, strategic selling, great program." I said, "Well, I'm glad you feel that way. You know, what makes you say so?" He goes, "The only time it doesn't work is when I don't use it." <laughs> said, wow, powerful statement. Yeah, that's a great endorsement. How often would you say you're using it? Yeah, maybe half the time. <laughs> oh my gosh! So, and that's, that's exactly true. what the, that's exactly what this chart is showing. So, you know, again, culture is what drives this. Having people that are on the ball, who you know are using this stuff, managers that are tracking the metrics and so on, all part of the equation. All right, I'm going to jump in here, um, and, and that's a great segue for me, Barry, because you know what we have found about the last year or so, and, and frankly, the last ten years, we put in, pra in place processes that start running well, but it seems like they immediately decay. I don't know if everyone else can relate to that, but but you had talked about as we were preparing for this, Barry, that I I want to take one more minute if you don't mind, talk about the CRM. Um, that's one little tidbit that I think is just critical to know what's been happening. That's the foundation of the whole you know, sales automation industry. What's been happening with CRM? Well, lots of people have invested in CRM over the last 20 years. And uh, you know, something like 82% of all companies now, B2B space, has you know, at least once uh, brought in CRM. What's interesting this year, uh, and again, folks will see it in the report. Um, the consistent use of the CRM that's been uh, adopted by the company, and, and by consistent use we mean um, uh, reps have incorporated into their daily workflow, uh, lowest we've seen in 10 years, lowest we've seen in a decade, if you can block that. And, and, and here there's more and more stuff that's being built upon, some people might say heaped upon CRM in terms of you know, all the point solutions that are becoming increasingly available. And the usage is the lowest it's been, consistent usage, the lowest it's been in 10 years. Unbelievable. Um, oh my heavens. You know, just, just to, to tell the audience how I first got to know Barry before he even knew I knew him, you did a landmark study clear back in 2005, right after Dave when I started InsideSales.com, where you compared companies that used CRM versus companies that did not. I think it was about 1,300 companies in your study. And you found that those who used CRM had a 17% higher increase in overall revenue. That's just about the list that the whole sales training industry gives. I mean, I, we're seeing around 20 22%. So CRM is the foundation. It's the essential of all um, technologies, in my opinion, and to see it starting to be 
starting to decay is alarming. I'm an old football coach, and that's you know we're, we're forgetting the blocking and tackling here <laughs> is, is what I'm seeing. So I wanted to go ahead and jump in and 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 talk about um, the uh, the change in sales process. That's that's the thing I call it decay and delay, and um, I'm I'm going to talk a little about using systems thinking to, to put proper process in place and what we call phantom process. If you're thinking that, the, that someone else is doing it and there's a process working, you're assuming it's working, you better wake up because it's probably not. <laughs> Tribal <laughs> knowledge is, is not the way to put process in place. You've got to start with a quarterback. We're going to go through each one of these. We're going to talk about how to map and model your process, know the levers that actually improve results, and a new concept around training and coaching and retraining I want to talk about that I think is going to be pretty landmark. So I'm going to key off of some of these core tidbits that, that Barry brought to the surface uh, in studying what's happened last year with trends and, and particularly on sales process decay. And I want to start with, with my favorite, uh, systems thinking. I, I went to the Naval Academy and had a roommate, Johnny Hayden, and he... Uh, he was one of the brightest kids I ever met at, at the Naval Academy. He, he's the only one I ever saw get a 4.0 more than once. And uh, and his major was systems engineering. I didn't even know what that was. I'd never heard of that before. And he shared with me, what, and, then, and then later on I took a philosophy course that introduced me to what's called systems thinking. And here's the model. He, you can solve almost any problem if you use this approach. You analyze your problem. You design a solution, you operate your solution, and then you evaluate how well it hits the mark. And if it's off slightly, you, you, you analyze where it's off and do the same thing and it becomes a loop. And if I were to summarize this whole thing into one word, it's the word test. And, and that's, that's how you iterate and improve. And if you think this way, then any problem can be solved. Now, what you do is you admit, I don't know the answer, but I know how to find out. We will test and test until we start zeroing in on the solution and then evaluate it and make it better. And this is, this is the core of really good systems thinking and infrastructure. And, and as you well, all know, hey, Tim, go ahead. Tim, I'm just interrupted for a second. So we've been talking about sales process here, and I've been talking about sales process for you know, 24 years or so, 25 years. Um, and you know, we show an arrow into the box, an arrow out of the box, and you know, inputs and outputs, and to, to the extent that the outputs are different than the inputs, something happened in the box, and that's process. And the way that translates to sales, translates to sales is, you know, the arrow in, those are called leads. The arrow out, those are called orders. And the box is a pipeline, and that's called sales process. But as it turns out, no, nobody's interested in sales process. What they're interested in is sales process improvement. You know, yes. Jason Jordan over advantage performances. The only reason you measure something is so you can improve it. And to do that, you know, going back to your your classmates diagram there, you need one more thing, which is the feedback loop. And that's where a lot of it breaks down today, you know, marketing wants to know what happens to the leads. They also, you know, the leads suck, but they don't tell them what happened to them and you're missing the feedback loop. So it's not a closed loop system like you were showing. And that's Exactly what you need for improvement. That is exactly right. That you know, um, the American fighter pilots are so good because they debrief after every mission. They make a note of it, and those notes become the starting place before the next mission. It's a continuous loop. And and in the, in, in the early days when Henry Ford built that assembly line with specialists, that became the in thing to do and, and what's happened with inside sales in this whole industry is we've also specialized. You know, the first place to specialize was, was breaking sales apart from support and then breaking up sales into appointment setting and closing and so on and it just keeps dividing. And specialization has some great strengths, but it also has two great weaknesses. And and the assembly line works great as long as there's a conveyor belt that keeps it moving. It keeps things moving forward, and as long as someone doesn't drop the baton in that relay race when they get the handoff or let it sit and stall. So 
specialization is the wave of the future in sales and marketing as long as we're really good at that feedback loop and as long as we avoid decay and delay. And, and that's what I want to talk about today. You know, all in BMW, this cool motorcycle here and these big turbines, they're all being done in the traditional manufacturing model. But the thing that we have to learn in software and in sales is that we have to learn these same rules that have been learned in manufacturing. So I want to talk about that. And like, like I said earlier, if you, uh, if you think that those phantom processes are running, think again. If you don't know for sure that someone's doing it and that process is being maintained, it probably has already decayed. Dave Elkington and I laugh all the time. We, I don't know if we laugh or cry, but we've probably reset the processes in our own business four or five different times over the last 10 years. And there's some rules we've learned that we want to share. We've learned it from our customers. And you know that, that old where you, you, you tell a secret and share it with what's called tribal knowledge, all that means is every time that secret is passed on, someone drops a piece of it. A percentage of it is, is, is decayed, it slows down, it delays, and that's the death knell of specialization. So we have to get really good at, at following the world of manufacturing and, and, and mapping out our process, documenting it. You know, I had a, a, a consultant come in years ago, Dr. Scott Baird, who worked with us, and he brought this little $19 book from Michael Gerber called The e -Myth. It was probably the single most powerful thing that happened in our business because this, this book teaches you how to go through the processes of your business and document them and perfect them and simplify them to the point where, in fact, what Michael Gerber recommends you do is you work on your business as if you were going to try and sell it as a franchise. A lot like McDonald's. You know, they've perfected every little piece of their business where they can plug in a, a brand new person to, to cook the perfect fries every time because of the, the process of cooking fries is posted right there on the fry making machine and they've got a step by step, they know just how much salt to put in, just how much time. Well, if you haven't done that in your business where you've documented and visualized your process and you don't have an owner, it will immediately decay. And that's what happens. It's, it's scary how, I mean, as soon as you leave the meeting where you've just documented, if you don't have an owner, if you don't have a quarterback, then all of a sudden, and this is, this is hats off to our, to the Seattle Seahawks for that great comeback. Oh, man. This is unbelievable. This is unbelievable. <laughs> that they, uh, they were behind by, like, what, 58 minutes of the game? Oh, well, it was nuts. I, I, I have to apologize to our own Todd Reiser over at Talent Acceleration Department. He's a Green Bay fan, and, boy, he's depressed today. But oh, yeah. uh, I'll tell you what. You've got to have someone who owns it. And, and then the next step, and you got to map it out. And, and I always recommend you start with really big picture. You know, you, you just go by overall divisions, first of all, and, and note where the handoffs occur. This is sort of a standard, you know, process mapped with the different divisions and what we call the life of a lead. You know, a lead starts with PR and goes to marketing, and then business development sets up the appointment. This is in a lead gen model like we have goes to sales, sign the contracts, goes to implementation, and then client success takes it from there. And it's fed and watered by the, the IT systems and, and the accounting department. But, but then what you do is you break it apart and you start drilling down. Now in a, in a system approach like Salesforce, you've, you've got processes around each of the core areas or objects in the system. This is where the magic happens. You've got to learn how to you know, in an inside sales space, you disposition each call. You change the status of the leads when they get converted to deals or opportunities. You've got to track where they are in that process. And then when they close, it ends up over at support, and, and you've got to build a case model. Those are the four primary processes that have to be documented in any software solution. And, and I remember clear back in 2006, the first thing I did in our company at Inside Sales, is this, this was the exact document. We built a process and visualized it on a single piece of paper, and then I fleshed it out with the steps below it, and this was our lead process. And it's still fairly relevant today. Now, there's a lot of additional little things here and there we've learned, 
And then once we had the lead flow working, we then uh, contracted with a, a local sales training organization called Griffin Hill, and they helped us map out. You know, we intensely stay out of the sales training world. Our, our infrastructure is more around systems. But they mapped out the basic sales stages, and then we fleshed them out on a single document with all the plays that we run. And this was, the, this was our sales process, and we stuck, st we're still using Griffin Hill. And you know what? There's two things I want to say about this. Cause, yeah, please. You, know, you, you may be aware I, I did sales process mapping through the, through the 90s with a bunch of folks. And, and um, for those of you listening, you know, the, A, it's surprising today how many companies still haven't mapped out the milestones, like those big green arrows up there. But typically if companies have done that, they'll go on to say, and here's what we do at each of those steps, which looks like what you've done here. I can't read this, so I'm going to assume those are the sales. Yeah, it's a little small print, sorry. Well, no, that's fine. And then the tools that are available for each of those. But here was the big aha for folks when I used to do sales process mapping with my partner, Joe Vavrika, is, okay, so we've got the milestones, and we've got the seller's actions. What are the buyer's actions at each of the steps to advance the sale? And that's a much truer measure of what progress you're making is what is the buyer doing? Are they holding up their end of the bar to advance the sale? Because uh, we're seeing you know, a huge percentage of forecast deals that result in no decision. And we think part of it is because they're not being adequately and consistently qualified throughout. You can do, a, a sales rep can do everything in the sales process alone except sign the deal. And there are people who are willing to watch you do that whole thing, and they're not doing any of their things. And when it comes to the end, there's like nothing there. So I really could, could not overstate the importance of how, how significant I think it is to have the buyer's actions as well. And the other thing, the two other things I'll say when you talk about the, uh, the manufacturing metaphor uh, or analogy is, the old line is, if the head of manufacturing ever took over the sales force, the first thing he or she would do is shut it down because the <laughs> scrap rate is unbelievable. I mean, if you did it in manufacturing, you, <laughs> they would ask, what are you doing over there? I mean, the scrap rate in, say, in the sales factory is about, you know, 80%. It's so like, true. You know, are you kidding me? So, um, and, and, you know, again, people can read about that in the report. Year after year, forecast accuracy is like an oxymoron. It just, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> it's not flipping a coin, isn't it? it? It's actually, it's worse than flipping a coin. This year, oh I think God. the number was 45.6% of forecast deals were actually won, you know, and aggregated across whatever, 1,200 companies. And if you think about the time, energy, and resource that goes into sales forecast, you could actually do as well or better flipping a coin. That's saying something. The other thing, oh I'm God. just going to say that when you showed the first thing, it was like, here are the big pieces, PR, and then it goes to here, marketing, and so on, is just to remind everybody, and, and here too, there should be another big arrow to take from the arrowhead of that last one and circles all the way around to the tail feathers of the first one to provide feedback. Yes, you know, no, you're right. Closed loop. System. Yeah, the one you showed where it, so it goes into the CRM information system. That's the whole point of putting this stuff in is so the system can crunch it and feed it back, you know, those dashboards and all the rest of it. You know, that's so uh, helpful. I, I, uh, I want to bring up a little bit later also because you had mentioned some interesting things happening with social media. I want to talk about that in just a bit here, but you know, this process map is so basic. It's literally what I did in about the first week at InsideSales.com. And, and, and now our, our consulting teams, you know, we consult around system integration. And uh, I wanted to show you, you know, sort of where we start with, with a, a process map today. And this is, this is from Gabe Larson and Dave Boyce in our teams here. And, and we go into, this is, this is a, a simple version from a client. We go in and we, we, we map the process from web lead all the way through to, um, you know, to opportunities at the end. And, and, and each one of these blue boxes is a ratio. This is current state. And then we come back and look at it and, and look at where the opportunities are to improve. 
and we come back with a future state of what we recommend in the green boxes. And of course, the goal is to significantly optimize the output. Well, you do that by moving the levers. And what I mean by that is, um, just like a backhoe, I, you know, I, I've been doing a lot of construction in my yard and having some fun and watching those back. I'm, I want to buy me a backhoe. <laughs> uh, they're fun. But what, what I mean by moving the levers is, what are the things that increase your increase your output? What are the inputs that you can change? And, and, and 10 years ago, when we were purely a transactional model, we taught everybody to make more calls. And, and, and then recently, send more emails, research more leads. In fact, one of our biggest opportunities is a new specialist position we call a lead researcher because we're finding a lot of this high-end enterprise business development most of the time being wasted is people prepping for calls. The sales reps don't want to talk to someone until they've had a day or two to prep. And, and so what you do is you systemize that preparation and it always comes down to research. They ask roughly the same questions. So could you systemize that and put it in the data so that you can speed up the, the time frame with which your, your high-end closers can go after these accounts? We're finding a big shift in just on-time meetings. 20 to 30 percent of meetings are either missed or late. That right there is huge fallout. So how can we just have our reps on time to these remote meetings? There's the traditional increasing of skill with sales training, following up better. Our whole MIT study with Dr. James Oldroyd is about following up faster and more persistently. Those are basic levers that people have to realize are critical in the day of the internet and it's right here and then of course marketing steps in and they throw more budget at it and 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 hiring throws more people but those are the basic levers to increase once you have a process in place and again you know uh, uh, one thing to everybody always wants to know you know what lever can I pull on it honestly there are about 20 levers there that could be compensation design could bring, could be CRM or a new point solution could be you know new training or whatever. Uh, one of the things I like to point out is uh, you need another component to make a lever work, and that's a fulcrum. And in our view of the world, the first line sales managers are the fulcrum to make any of these levers work and not decay over time and not delay in the implementation. And if the first line managers, and it's you know I'll go back to. Well, I said you know quite a while ago in terms of Drucker culture eat strategy for breakfast. The uh, senior management is using the tools and you know demonstrates you know that they know how to do it. And here's what I'm looking at, and it trickles all the way down to the organization. The first line managers are then in great position to provide the leverage that they really everybody's looking for when you know when they make those investments in the first place. You know I have to agree with you, Barry. Um, in the early days, people would ask me all the time, they'd say, okay, what's the single most important catalyst for this whole thing to work? And I would say, roughly what you said, I'd say, a scrappy sales manager. <laughs> that's, that's the key. I love, I love your phrase, the fulcrum. That's, that's yeah. where everything focuses is if you've got that scrappy sales manager who keeps the machine moving, they work in the machine. You know, directors and VPs work on the machine, but the manager keeps it running. And that's just that's critical. So, you know, we're asked what are the big elements of decay from the people perspective? Well, you know, as you put a process in place and you train everybody, I always use the example, let's say we train a hundred people on our solution. Well, normal attrition is about thirty percent. So one year later, you know, you you've lost a major portion of those people who had that initial training experience. And usually by then your training has even decayed somewhat. Two years later, you're about half, and three years later, wow, you, you've got maybe 25 to 30 percent of that original team who had that, that first experience are even qualified to use the system. Everybody else got it by tribal knowledge. And, and that's yep. where the problem is. You know, I came from the world of Franklin Covey where we were the largest training company in the world, and we learned something pretty powerful. We measured our training by, frankly, how fast it decayed and, and what we could do to put it in place so that it would have a stronger residual effect. 
and and this this is an interesting new recommendation. This is really the first year I've ever recommended that people do this. Um, you know, training organizations have said, yeah, all you need to do is be trained once, and then we'll coach you. That was the big breakthrough. For years, there were trainers, and then coaches came around. But basically, I'm learning that coaching isn't enough because coaching is usually only a small fragment of the initial experience. So what I'm recommending now is what I call a, an immersion training model where people go back through that original boot camp or base camp model where they see the full training curriculum. Let's say it's sales training. Put them back through this thing about every quarter. If, if you get a 22% lift in productivity from your sales training and it decays almost completely within about you know, 6 to 12 weeks, why don't you just do it again? <laughs> and this model sort of shows that, that that baseline improves with repetition. What's your experience on that, Barry? Have you have you seen roughly the same thing with with decay around the training model? Well, yeah, there's no question about the fall off. Um, I think having been on both sides of that, I think it's going to be very difficult to get uh, CSOs to sign off on. It's a two day training every quarter, putting taking pulling people out of the field for two days to go through the same training again, but. Uh, I do agree that um, that relying on coaching alone is, is in our SMO. I talked about that report, which we'll be launching next. Um, we track this, uh, and a lot of manager time that's called coaching is really talking about deals. So there's you know inspecting the pipeline and deals. What's going to take to bring this in this period? That's that's can be called coaching, but it's coaching on the opportunity, not on the rep's skill or ability of personal professional development. So you really want to separate those two conversations. And if you, if you, there are different ways that uh, that people are bringing training back in front of people, whether they're doing it with online videos or, you know, there's one that sends tests out to their phones on a spot check basis, and you know they're graded by peers. There are all kinds of things. There's, there's no question that it falls off, and if you can do something, uh, different ways of stimulating it, it's kind of like the flywheel effect. Once it's spinning, if you can just keep giving it a shove, giving it a shove, giving it a shove, it's so much easier than getting it going from a standstill again. Yes, yes, and, and, and if you run the numbers, if you look at, uh, if we think about it this way, if we, if we give it, let's, 22% uh, lift in results, Mm -hmm. And and we take uh, let's say we don't do two days of training let's say we do one day of training so in three months mm -hmm. that would be mm -hmm. one one out of sixty work days that's mm -hmm. that's um, what is that that's about three per four percent so you're getting a twenty two percent lift in result for a four percent reinvestment in time then all of a sudden mm -hmm. it might make sense and and mm -hmm. that's what I'm finding in our own world we're putting our people back through this immersion training. Now, as you've said, you can optimize it, simplify it a little bit, review it. But what I'm really advocating, folks, is I'm saying, you know, throw your people back in the pool of, of immersion of, of, of the content of training. And, and, and you said earlier, Barry, that things are moving so fast with the technology and the techniques and people trying yep. to keep up that it's moving too fast to just hope they're going to give it with occasional, you know, professional development kind of models. Um, yeah, Franklin, we had to show this little slide, and then I want you to do a, an analysis with me of this. This thing is it's a little bit complex, but but look at what we've got here. This is called the cone of learning. I, 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 it was originally studied by Edgar Dale back in 1969, but we found at Franklin that people would learn only 10% if they read it. If they heard you speak it, they'd, they, they'd gather about 20% of the content. If they watched you do it, it was 30%. If, if they could both see you and hear you with a live demonstration, it was usually 50%. And then the active learning kicked in on that uh, fifth tier. If, if they could participate in a discussion and, and, and talk back what you were talking about, it was 70%. But the big one was this one. If they would actually have to teach the content within 48 hours, 
meaning they had to take everything you taught them and turn it around and put it into a, a dramatic presentation where they actually simulate doing the real thing by teaching it to another person, they had a 90% uh, retention rate. Because what we've learned is learning is not understanding. Learning is doing. Understanding is what you see when, is what you get when you watch that calculus teacher do it on the board. You know, and you, you get it while they're doing it. But man, when you go home <laughs> that night and you have to work a few problems, you didn't you didn't learn it. You just barely understood it, and, and then you're in trouble. Well, you, you didn't you didn't even understand it. I, I <laughs> a friend of mine was going through uh, you know, getting her credential, and this guy that had been a teacher forever was teaching the program. He said, if you have a student say, "I understand it. I just can't explain it." They don't understand <laughs> it. <laughs> everybody's heard that one. Probably everybody's used that one. There's an old maxim in training. I hear, I forget, I see, I remember, I do, I understand. And yeah. I agree with you completely that it's an active thing. The thing I would say, and you don't have to go back to the slide, but the, you know, the 1 in 60 and the you know, 22% for 3% and so on. Here's the thing I absolutely believe, and it's almost never done, and it's the key to what you're presenting here, and that's pre- and post-testing. So. Yeah. Whatever it is you're measuring, uh, I'll quote Jason again, you only measure it if you want to improve it. So great. Uh, as long as you're, if you're getting a 22% uplift, man, I'll make, uh, uh, let's see, I'll, I'll give you uh, $3 for $25. I'll do that all day long. You bet. And uh, uh, what you need is to make sure you're getting a 22% uplift, that you're getting decent uplift, and uh, and you'll be, you know, you'll be making a, a, a great bet. But I think very few people do pre and post testing or do consistent measuring along the way. It's, it's that feedback loop again. That's exactly what you're saying. Absolutely. Well, everybody, we're, we're coming to the end here. We've got a Q&A period we want to talk about, but, but I really want to invite everyone to participate. This survey is still open. It's the Sales Performance Optimization Study. How many years have you been doing this, Barry? I mean, you've been doing this whole concept for quite a while, but how about this specific yeah. study? Uh, this specific study, uh, it, it has been in this form now for about 12 or 13, 13 years. Jim, actually, my partner Jim Dickey started this back in 94, so we're saying it's the 21st annual. Back then, they were you know, doing surveys, actually calling and, and interviewing folks, but you know, we've been doing it online since 2004, and um, uh, the survey is, is, has been in, in its current shape for you know the last 13 years or so. So we got a we got a ton of data. <laughs> so I, I, I and, golly, it's like 1,200 people I think have taken this in the past, and and, and we believe. The, the, the more we participate, everybody, this is, I'm asking the whole community of Inside Sales to, to, to jump in and take this survey because the nice thing is, I mean, I got last year's copy. It was 214 pages. Just about every question I could think of was in there. And, and everyone who takes this survey will get a copy of it themselves. Isn't that right, Barry? It's true. There are a couple of things I want to say. Um, it, to answer the questions, you probably need to you, you need to be at least manager level or above. Um, but yes, everyone who completes the survey and the you can start it. The problem is you'll get frustrated because there are a bunch of questions you can't answer, and then you start making stuff up, which we don't want anybody doing. So um, it, this shows the 2014, but you'll actually get the 2015 uh, survey. The key trends is the is the opening going forward is the ending. In between, we've got sales process, sales force demographics, sales management, and then the three reports I talked about, find more, win more, keep and grow more. Um, but yes, go to this um, link, take the survey, and uh, February 3rd, you'll get a copy of the report plus the full set of metrics, about 85 metrics, I think. And then for the telesales folks, uh, a month later, you'll get the telesales report and another 80-something you know, metrics. So. Um, you know, pretty pretty high return on effort, I think. Yeah, and so we we try to make a real simple URL here. It's just uh, bitly slash CSO survey. So go take that uh, manager and above. 
You'll get a copy for your teams. It's extremely valuable. We we started using Barry uh, Barry's data clear back in 2005. Um, it an it, it's the landmark study of, of the industry, specifically CSO insights. So let's talk about some questions. I one right off the top here. You know, we promised social media and some of the insights there. You know. I get asked all the time, uh, you know, is social selling really starting to work? Is it really getting traction? Give us some insights on social media and what you're finding, Barry. Well, uh, at the end of um, 2012, um, I was involved in a, a group of, uh, you know, a, a online internet radio show where they had a group of visionaries and. Everybody was talking about social media, social media, and you know, it came to me, and I said, "Yeah, we really don't, we aren't seeing it. The jury's still out." Um, one year later, 2000, December 2013, the jury was in, and social media is definitely happening. I mean, just in, in the B2B world, it's been happening in consumer for some time, but um, not everybody knows what to do with it. Not everybody's harnessed it. Uh, there's still plenty to learn. We did a um, case study with ADT and Liz Gelb O'Connor. She's, you know, I think sort of the queen of social media and B2B, and she's done some amazing work over there. And, uh, if people are interested in that, you know, just have them, here's my email right here, just drop me a line and we'll get uh, a copy of that ebook out to you and you can read about it. But social media, it still has a long way to go in terms of people, the things we've been talking about, you know, what are the big pieces, measuring, um, figuring out the return, what is the lift, there's a lot of energy going into it. I can tell you, we see it in the lead management social engagement survey. The shift in investment is just huge. And the thing that's going along with this that's helping fuel that is the huge uh, investment and interest in mobile. So you, you've got you know, mobile CRM, mobile technology, and uh, you know, social. Uh, it's all very much happening. We've got several metrics that I think people would find of interest on that. All right, next question, and 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 this one I think is back to you again, Barry. You know, uh, as as we worked our way out of out of the the recession, um, you know, things started moving up. Or, but but why do you think the trends are starting to point downward again? What what's causing this? Well, you know, there's an old line that, uh, you know, rising revenues hide all sins. And I think, um, you know, the, the economy has been very strong, particularly here in the U.S. You know, not everybody's in North America, but, you know, probably most of the folks on the call today are. And, you know, we're just having a lot more fun than the people over in Europe down in Latin America are having. And, uh, and I think people, when, when you look, when you're measuring your success on the number, you know, I, I mentioned the sales mastery talk last week. You are not your number. You are not your number. Your your number is a reflection of what you do and how well you do it. And the thing I say when I'm speaking on mastery, quota is a, is a company's best guess at a territory or an account's potential. Yeah, I'll say that again. Quota. It's a company's best guess at a territory or an account's potential, but it has nothing to do with your potential. And so when people, you know, buy into this thing, you know, good number, good rep, bad number, no donut, you know, you are not your number. Your number is a reflection of what you do and how well you do it, and that's where the coaching and the measurement, all the things we've been talking about, you know, for the last 45 minutes or so here, that's, what, that's where it, it all comes into play. That's great. Um, next question, what are the most important levers to pull? I think I'll jump in for a minute on that one. I'd love to hear from you, yeah. Barry. You know, uh, 10 years ago, when we, when we cranked up our solution and we went out there and the Internet was hot and we were, we were starting in the small business world and working our way up, it was really simple, make more calls. <laughs> that was it, make more calls. And and then you know we found that the internet was having so much impact with with latency and with and, and, and people had, had built these websites and they figured oh this is a great way to automate all my support I don't need to worry about putting phone numbers out there so they they actually didn't put in a phone number out there and then they realized 
people wanted to talk, and so the, the, the website became just a massive catcher's mitt for all the other media that was, that was pitching product, and now it's the primary thing people go to. And so the next key was, was to, you know, to respond fast. You know, the, the, the MIT research and so on with Harvard Business Review, that was probably the next big breakthrough. You know, follow up fast, follow up persistently. And, and I think we're coming back now, probably the third big lever is back to the people. It's, it's really focusing on the skill, not just the sales skill of what you say, but the process skill and the system skill of what you do and how well you do it. So I would say make more calls, res respond fast and persistently, and then keep training and retraining the skill sets of your people, not just on what they say, but what they have to do. What, what would you add to that, Barry, about the levers that, that make the most impact? Well, well, I, you know, I think we're nearing the end here, and it's it's perfect. <laughs> it's a perfect question because uh, it, it's really interesting. We ended the SPO last year, the going forward section. Said, and, and you asked, you know, do we ever look back and see how we did with our predictions? So I, I did that, and the thing we said last year is. If you think you just need to do more of the same thing only faster, you know, think again. Because in our view, that horse had been ridden as far and as fast as she could go. And um, what we're saying this year is, and, I'm, and I, that doesn't mean you should make more calls. You shouldn't respond faster and so on. But if you're doing something wrong, doing more of it isn't faster isn't going to be the answer. And um, you know, people look at strictly as a numbers game. You know, the, the harder I work, the luckier I get. You know, there's truth to that. But if we go back to that early slide, if your if your company has grown to be on the right side of the life curve and you're doing things over on the left side, you know, focusing on product and lone wolf and you know, calling at the low levels and so on, uh, you can't get that. You just can't. You know, the, the thing I said in this year's section is you're like trying to out Funny you should talk about the the backhoe is like trying to out John Henry trying to outrace the steam shovel. You know, it's just not going to happen. <laughs> so yeah, you're right. The, uh, point. the the thing that that we said is it's time to go back, and, and you have touched on each of these. I'll just echo them to show my agreement. Is the old process, uh, the old mantra used to be people, process, technology, people, process, technology. And what we added to that a number of years ago was a fourth pillar, which was knowledge. And I would say what lever you should pull first depends on where you are. People, do you have the right people, process, technology, knowledge. And I'll put in a plug for this. Everything we've talked about so far, you know, you, you get and, and you just for taking the survey. We do, do, because we have all this data, we do benchmarks. It's a great place. You can buy an industry benchmark. You can buy a custom benchmark. You can get a peer benchmark. We have all these different options for folks. But don't kid yourself about where you are, where you stand. You know, the whole point of a benchmark is a measure that's put in the ground that you know exactly where that is, and you measure from there. And then you can decide, do we need more training? Do we need to look at our comp plan? Do we need to hire new folks? Do we need to retain the great folks? Are we losing our, you know, our talent just when they're getting productive? I mean, they're, they're, I actually put this in the, in the report as well. So everybody's going to feel like they don't need to read the report. What lever should we pull? I'll give you a consultant's answer. It depends. Yeah. You know, no, it depends that's helpful. That's great. Are. We want to thank everybody for joining us today. I, I want to let you know also that this, this has been such a fun project for me that I'm going to write it up on a Forbes article that's coming out today. And uh, look for that. It, it's going to be... Uh, a little bit long name, it's going to be the 2015 Trends Report, Sales Process Strategy and so on. Look for that on Forbes. We'll, we'll highlight this. We will include the link. Remember, it's bit.ly slash CSO survey. That's what we want you to take. Go click on that. Take the survey. You'll get a copy of it yourself, and you'll want that for your sales team this coming year. It has answers. It has trends. It shows you where to go. Barry, thanks for taking time with us today. This has been wonderful. I think this is a great way to start off the new year looking forward. I had a great time. Thanks again. Uh, thanks, everybody, for listening. And uh, 
Yeah, let's uh, let's do this again. It was a blast. Let's do. We'll talk soon. Take care, everybody. Okay. Take care. Yeah.